Good evening. I guess our internet's down, so we don't have the song or whatever going on before. So we're going to start um, with number 867. Number 867 to Canaan's land. I'm on my way. Number 867. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no cheer dimmed eyes, where all is love and the soul never dies. A rose is blooming there for me where the soul never dies. And I will spend eternity where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dimmed eyes, where all is love and the soul never dies. A love light beams across the foam where the soul never dies. It shines to light the shores of home where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dimmed eyes, where all is love and the soul never dies. I'm on my way to that fair land where the soul never dies, where there will be no parting hand and the soul never dies. No sad pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the fellowship that we're able to have this evening to come and take the time out of our weeks to gather around and, and open your word and sing songs to you, Lord. We thank you for being able to be here, for being able to do this. We thank you for everyone that's able to, to be here to build each other up. And we thank you for preserving your word that we can study it and um, be more like Jesus, Lord. Be more like you want us to be more accepting in your sight, Lord. We pray that as we study the book of Luke this evening, Lord, that we can apply it in our everyday lives and understand it and share it with others that need to hear it, Lord. We thank you so much for the church that meets here, Lord. We pray for everyone that's not able to be here with us this evening. Pray for all those that are sick and ill. Pray that you can restore their health, for you are the great physician, Lord. And Pray that they can be back with us as soon as possible. Lord, we pray that uh, you forgive us of our sins and watch over us as we go throughout this fellowship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Okay, good to see you tonight. You able to be here and to uh, have this fellowship and to open up God's word and see what the Lord had for uh, them at the, 
the disciples that were with him to encourage them and strengthen them, the crowds that were before him, and also for us today. And that's the reason why the Word of God is so pertinent. Uh, that's the reason why it is uh, like no other uh, book that exists on this earth. And that is, uh, it, it applies yesterday, today, and forevermore. So we ended up uh, talking about um, how that uh, the apostles needed rest after coming back from their journey. And so uh, the Lord was looking for a place for them to go to, uh, not only for uh, the disciples, but also for himself. And we looked at some scriptures uh, last week concerning that. And so he took them uh, to a desert place near Bethsaida. So we're just going to kind of uh, look at a couple of things uh, at the end of uh, last week's lesson uh, to uh, bring us up to, um, to the point of where we want to be as far as Jesus feeding the uh, 25,000, maybe 30,000 uh, people. It's just absolutely incredible. But uh, this was a small town in the north uh, at the end of the sea, of, uh, the sea of Galilee, across the Jordan, and we talked about last week how uh, this was. Uh, you know, Herod wanted to know. You know, he wanted to know who who it was uh, that was uh, that people were following, that were people listening to his uh, teaching, and so. Uh, but he's now out. You know, so so he was at that moment in time. He was under Herod's jurisdiction. So what he does is he takes them across on the other side of the Jordan, and now he and the disciples are out of Herod's jurisdiction. Uh, so only Luke among the uh, gospel writers places the feeding of the 5,000 men at Bethsaida. Uh, Matthew chapter 15, verses 32 through 39, and also Mark chapter 6, verses 32 through 44, uh, also um, uh, records this particular story of where Jesus is, but only Luke says it, they're, they're in the desert, but Luke says that they're at Bethsaida. So once we get to uh, chapter 10, verse 13, we're going to see, as I also mentioned last week, that Jesus laments over Bethsaida's uh, refusal to repent. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21 also uh, speaks of that, but not like uh, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 13. So going there at this present time uh, was intended uh, for a time of withdrawal, a time for private prayer with God, and a time for Jesus to continue his training with his apostle because he was, this was ongoing. Uh, he was always in the process of training his disciples as he does us because that's what disciple means. It means learner. That's what it means. It means learner, uh, literally. And so we are all learners of Jesus Christ when he says that we are all disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what the Greek word literally means. It means a learner. So we're always to be in the process of learning uh, from the master, and that, of course, is Jesus Christ. And that's what the disciples or the apostles, that's what they were uh, doing. And it was going to continue until Jesus Christ left this earth. He wasn't going to quit training them. He would always train them. But it was time for them to retire. It was time for them to retreat. Uh, but there was a massive crowd. And you remember last week, you know, they had... Uh, they saw Jesus getting on the boat and leaving and going to this place, but they ran and they got there at the same time. Not, not only really at the same time, they were there before they arrived. So they had to run pretty fast, that's for sure. Uh, but the apostles and Jesus, they, they arrived at the place where the people were waiting for them. I mean, there was no rest here, none whatsoever. And we just never know. This is a, have, you ever, uh, have you ever had an interruption that you just didn't care to have? We have them all the time. We have, we have them all the time. Uh, does it uh, irritate you? I mean, does it cause a, a certain amount of irritation when there's interruptions? Yeah. Uh, they can be annoying. <laughs> uh, however, uh, Jesus doesn't indicate whatsoever that he was annoyed that he was irritated, that this was an interruption that he just could not bear, therefore he got angry. That's what makes Jesus different from us because I think all of us has been in that position or been at that uh, moment in time to where uh, we have become irritable or that we, because of the interruptions that we have, whatever they are, because uh, we had, you know, we had, 
you know, we have set out to do something, but then all of a sudden that something that we set out to do has now been interrupted. <laughs> um, and this was happening to Jesus all the time, all the time. But he always had the, the, the greatest attitude. That's the reason why we're to follow him. And the only way that we can follow others is if others are following him. <laughs> uh, so Jesus, when he came out, he saw all the people. And the Bible says that he was moved with compassion after being so tired. And after training and after encouraging and after strengthening and continuing to do that with the apostles. Uh, still, when he saw the crowd, now the apostles, they didn't feel the same way Jesus did. They would have felt the same way we would. <laughs> but for Jesus, when he saw the crowd, when he saw that many people that wanted to hear his message, that wanted to hear his teaching, they just could not get enough of, uh, of what Jesus was saying or just his, just his person, just his disposition, just his personality, just wanted to gravitate, just wanted to be in his presence, wanted to be around him. Uh, Jesus, when he saw the crowd in front of him, he was moved with compassion. Jesus knew that they wanted to hear more of his teaching. So he did not get upset with the interruption, with the, with the intrusion, if you will, of his plans. Because, you know, he had, an he had an itinerary, and uh, he didn't really deviate from that. Well, I guess he did deviate from that itinerary all the time. But nevertheless, he knew exactly where he was going to be at a specific moment in time. And this, this was something that happened every single day of his life. But therefore, he also knew that this was going to happen. He, all, you know, he knew that the crowd was going to be there. So he began to teach them about the kingdom of God and healing all the people. So that was the very first thing he did. He started healing all the people and he started uh, teaching them the kingdom of God. And he, and he was nonstop. He just kept on going. As long as the people were there, he kept on doing what he was doing. And that was uh, teaching about the kingdom of God. And so he did both of these things throughout his ministry. There's absolutely no telling how many people Jesus healed from their infirmities. This was a very, very large crowd. And they were all coming up to him, whatever it was. It didn't matter if it was a stomach ache or if it was something chronic or if it was something serious. Whatever it was, if it was leprosy, if it was uh, Jesus was healing every one of their illnesses and their diseases, their sickness. In Luke chapter 9, verse 12, would you go ahead and read that, Zach? Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. Okay, so, you know, with, with that comment made by the disciples, what are the disciples saying? Are they on a spiritual level or are they on a physical level? It's all physical, isn't it? You would think that it would be a spiritual level. So they did not have the same attitude that Jesus. When Jesus saw the crowd, he was full of compassion. When the disciples saw the crowd, they said, get rid of them. <laughs> quite, quite a contrast there. Uh, you know, but they had been with him for quite some time. I mean, it was getting to the end of the day. Jesus had been speaking for a long time. None of this 30-minute to 40-minute sermon. I mean, this was like an hours of, uh, of a sermon. And so now it's getting at the end of the day. And, and he said, and they came to the conclusion that as the disciples, they, you know, they were able to perceive that, hey, these people have not eaten all day. They, they, they're bound to be hungry. We need to send them away right now, Jesus. Quit preaching. <laughs> and uh, let them go. We're, we're in a desolate place. We're in a desert. You know, it's pretty far from the nearest town. They need to go to that town and get them some food. So this is recorded in the other three Gospels. And I don't know if you're writing this down, but one is Mark chapter 14, verses 3, 13 through 21. I'm sorry, it's Matthew. It's Matthew 14, 13 through 21. Mark chapter 6, verses 34 through 44. And John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Now, John records that the first suggestion came from Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 5. The disciple, but Jesus is always, he's always um, seeing whether or not, seeing what kind of attitude, even though he already knows the attitude, even though he already knows the mindset, even though the, he knows that the disciples are on a physical plane, he still asks the question because he wants an answer from them. Uh, he wants them to verbalize it. 
he wants them to talk, uh, talk about their, uh, you know, how they feel at that specific moment in time. So uh, the disciples did not have enough food or money to feed the multitude. And that was the problem. And that was the, that's what they were up against. They knew. I mean, they knew exactly what was in the treasury. I don't know if Judas uh, could say that because he was always pilfering from it. But nevertheless, you know, he, uh, uh, he was in charge of the treasury. Judas was. And I'm sure Judas, he very well could have been the one that was, you know, trying to uh, encourage all the other disciples. We can't do this. We don't have enough money. We need this money for ourselves and not for a crowd, you know, at this size. And so he knew that they didn't have the money or the or the food to be able to feed this multitude. So they suggested sending them away so they could find food for, them, for themselves. It's almost sunset. This is at the end of the Jewish day. So it's almost sunset. The people had been listening to Jesus for hours. Darkness would be coming soon. So it was time for Jesus to let them go. That was their attitude about it. It was time for Jesus to let them go. However, Jesus gave no sign. He gave no sign whatsoever of stopping. They were telling Jesus, hey, you need to let these people go. He might have glanced at them, he might have looked at them, but he kept on speaking. <laughs> uh, so we see clearly two contrasting attitudes towards meeting the needs of the people. However, before this happened, Jesus had already tested Philip. He had already tested Philip with a question of how the people were going to be fed. You're going to see that in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. So it's in John that Jesus says he is the bread of life. So, I mean, that's how Jesus defined himself. Uh, is the bread of life. John chapter 6, verses 22 through 35. But it is Andrew. It is Andrew who comes to the rescue, so to speak. He really didn't come to the rescue. But he was the only one of the twelve that had any faith whatsoever. But he had a great faith. It kind of, it kind of uh, makes me think that's the reason why he was not chosen in the inner circle of Peter, James, and John. It was because the Lord already knew his heart. The Lord knew that he was already mature. The Lord already knew that he had a great faith because Jesus knew his heart. But he also knew that Peter, James, and John, they needed some chiseling. They needed some more work. I mean, James and John, they were referred to, they were referred to as sons of thunder. Uh, Peter, he would just, you know, he was, you know, he was a person that uh, would say, you know, he, there were a lot of times, you know, he stuck his foot in his mouth because he would just say things he shouldn't say. You know, there were always uh, things that were, that were wrong. So he was, he was pretty rough around the edges. So I, Plus, there had to be witnesses, two to three witnesses. So Jesus, you know, had to choose three apostles out of the 12 to always be there as a witness, whatever he did or wherever he went. And so he chose these three, Peter, James and John. Well, these were all brothers, except for Andrew. Andrew was a brother, but he wasn't chosen uh, to be in the uh, inner circle of Jesus. Two brothers, James and John and the apostle Peter. But James and John, they were first cousins of Jesus. Not to say that there was any kind of nepotism here whatsoever. I'm not saying that. <laughs> no nepotism, but they were first cousins. Because his mother and Mary, they were sisters. That is, the mother of James and John. They were sisters. Uh, but what is... Uh, Jesus say in Luke chapter 10, verses 41 through 42, are all. Luke chapter 10, verses 41 through 42. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. That's pretty much what he's wanting to tell the disciples. That these people, they have chosen the good portion. And uh, he tells Martha, hey, don't be worried about so many things. Just be worried about one. You know, maybe that'll take your mind off, you know. Uh, you know, whatever she was doing, just 
Think about one thing. We, you know, that's all that's needed. That's it. Okay, then John chapter 6, verse 35, and also verse 51. Sarah? John chapter 6, verse 35, and verse 51. Six thirty-five. Uh huh. In verse fifty-one. I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, "No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again." In verse fifty-one, I think. Fifty-one. I am the living bread that came yeah. down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. That's all he says, I'm the living bread. He also said, I'm the living water. He told that to the, uh, to the woman at the well, that I'm the living water. So he eats both. There's nothing that Jesus cannot quench, either spiritual food or physical food, uh, either spiritual water or physical water. Uh, and, you know, so I want to go back uh, just a second before we uh, move on. I want to go back to Andrew. Uh, Andrew had a uh, tremendous faith that no one else had uh, because of his uh, willingness to go to this uh, young, young lad who had a, had a lunch. He had a lunch that his mother had prepared for him that morning just in case that he wasn't going to be able to eat. He was going to be able to eat sometime during that day. And he had five loaves and two fish. He had more bread than he did fish. <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But... Uh, Andrew was able to finesse uh, this young boy to give him his, because of his personality, because of who he was, uh, he was able to get that, he was able to get that, he was able to uh, tell that lad, hey, you need to bring your lunch and let's go, to, let's go see Jesus with uh, what you have uh, that your mother, he didn't say mother, but I'm saying mother, that, that your mother had uh, prepared for you today. I mean, I don't know how Andrew did it, did it but that young boy, he followed him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with his lunch, that's for sure. Now, the loaves, in John chapter 6, verse 9, did we read that? John chapter 6, verse 9. I want to read that also. There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Yeah, but he still brought them, didn't he? But where are they among so many? Well, the uh, loaves are labeled as barley loaves. Well, a barley loaf was for the poor. It was for the poor. It was, it was a cheap food among the Jews. This bread was often eaten stuffed with fish. That's what they did. They just stuffed the piece of bread with fish. They had a fish sandwich. That's what they did. <laughs> so it appears that the young boy didn't even have enough fish to be adequate for the five loaves. He needed more fish. What are you going to do? Cut, that, cut those two fish up and try to put it in between five loaves? Well, let me tell you, it's, in the Greek, it's little fish, about the size of a sardine. So they weren't going to make too much of a dent on five loaves. Uh, but it, so um, anyway, it had the appearance of a pancake. It usually was broken instead of being sliced, as we would uh, slice a loaf of bread if we were... Uh, to go to Saltgrass or Redborn or someplace like that. Just pick your place, your favorite place to go to. Papado's, those are all high-end restaurants, but they bring you bread, <laughs> you know, and then you sl we slice that bread, and then we get full before our main meal comes out. But the statement by Jesus to his apostle was not a suggestion. He says, the word you right there is emphatic in the Greek, and it is a it is a command um, that uh, Jesus wanted them to figure it out. He wanted them to figure it out. He was giving the apostles an opportunity. You know, can you reach out and can you think on a spiritual level instead of always remaining on a physical level? I want you to figure this out. Come up with a solution. Use some, use some kind of faith that, that you demonstrated while you were proclaiming the kingdom of God. You remember when he sent them out? He sent those 12 out. 
to go pl uh, proclaim the, uh, the word of God. And he gave them the power to heal. He gave them the power to cast out demons. He gave them the power uh, to heal all kinds of manner of disease, diseases. And he said, now, can you go back and remember the faith that you had then and using that faith and demonstrating that faith? Can you exhibit that faith at this moment? That's what Jesus virtually is saying to them. Um, and unfortunately, they were... They were instead focusing only on the physical level, not the spiritual. So they had forgotten. They had forgotten that with Jesus. Uh, they had forgotten uh, about the faith that they had when they went, out, went about uh, proclaiming the will of God. But they had forgotten the biggest thing, and that is with Jesus Christ, all things are possible. All things are possible with Jesus. And they had seen that over and over and over again uh, in uh, the ministry of Christ. So almost sarcastically, knowing what they had uh, was for, knowing what they had was far from enough food, the multitude, uh, uh, to feed this multitude, it was, it was like, you don't expect us to go and buy food for all these people, do you, Jesus? I mean, it really is. That, I mean, it really, that's what they're saying sarcastically. Is this really what you want us to do is go buy food for all these people? Because the apostles knew that the task was impossible to fulfill for, for at the least three reasons. First, they knew that they were too far from any place to go and buy food. So they're, look, they're looking at a logical reason as to why they cannot feed this many people. Second, even if they found a place to purchase the amount of food necessary to feed around 25,000 people, because that's how many people that they had. They had at least 25,000 people. They would have no way for carrying it back. Uh, carrying all the food back for that many people. However, third, even if they found a place to buy the food, figure out a way to carry it all back, they still would not have had the necessary funds in their treasury to be able to buy it. Philip said in John chapter 6, verse 7, that they had 200 denarian, denarii, but the Greek word here is denarian. They only had 200 denarian, and that would have been insufficient, not even to get a little. Some would have to do without if we spent all that money and that's all the money we had, not knowing that Jesus could create money. I mean, if, 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 that was the, if that's what they um, decided to do, then Jesus would just create the money to buy the food. It would have been no problem for Jesus. I mean, he tells Peter that in order to pay the taxes, go to the uh, nearest water and grab the first fish that comes out. He didn't even have a fishing pole. The fish just comes right up to him. He grabs the fish, opens up his mouth, and there's money in the mouth of that fish. Now, what are the chances of that happening? One in five billion? <laughs> one, one in a trillion of that happening? The first fish that comes out of the ocean is a, is a fish with money in it? <laughs> yeah. So Jesus could have created the money. That'd been one, that would have been one way. They could have at least offered that suggestion. Christ, can't you just create some money and we'll go buy the food right now? But this 200 denarius, denarian is not going to do it. Um, but Jesus was testing his apostles. They didn't, they didn't pass the test, with the exception of maybe Andrew. However, Jesus was teaching them, helping them to grow, learn, see the, see, see the power, see his power, for them to know that Jesus is God, that he is the bread of life, that he's the one who provides both physical and spiritual needs. It does not matter. It's nothing for him. He can do either. And as, mu and as much that is needed and, um, and it's never going to run dry. So in verse 14, let's read uh, verse 14. Who has the? John 6, 14. Uh-huh. Uh, no, and not. No, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 14. But they were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Make them sit down by 50s in a company. Okay. So he says there's about 5,000 men. And he says to sit them down in groups of about 50 each. Uh, the Greek word, andrus, refers to men only. That's it. 
when he said men right here in Luke. That's the, that's the Greek word he used, and it, and it refers to men only. Uh, in Matthew 14, 21, it says that plus women and children. So you have to look at all four Gospels to see uh, how, many, how many were there. And so Luke says there were 5,000 men. Uh, Matthew then says, well, you know, there was also women and children there. Uh, therefore, organization was absolutely necessary. Therefore, Jesus commanded them to sit down. He, they had to get organized, feeding twenty-five to 30,000 people when you include both women and children along with 5,000 men. Mark records that they all sat down in groups of 50 and 100. So there are different, uh, you know, uh, Luke just says they, they did it in 50s, but Mark says it was both 50 and 100. Uh, this allowed the apostles to walk among the groups as they would distribute the food among each group and do so one by one. However, before the food was multiplied, it would be very interesting to know as to what the apostles were thinking as all these groups were being divided among 25,000 people. What were they thinking? This had to be fascinating because Jesus was about to perform a spectacular spectacular, incredible, incomprehensible miracle for them to witness and experience. He wanted them to see this. He wanted them to know his power. Uh, the only thing that we can think of, I think, that, uh, that really demonstrates this is God uh, sending manna out of heaven for two and a half million people in the, in the wilderness. Two and a half million people. And he's sending He's sending manna and quail out of heaven to feed two and a half million people and did it every day, every day. So he can just keep creating quail <laughs> and he can keep creating manna and just let it fall from heaven for all the children of Israel to eat it. And Jesus is God. So this would have been nothing for him, 25,000 people compared to two and a half million people. Who was the rock that followed Israel in the wilderness for all those many years? It was Jesus. He was the one that was giving them water, that is physical water, but he was also the one giving them spiritual water. The man that was coming out, you know, of heaven uh, by the Lord. And he, they were also receiving uh, their water to where their thirst was quenched uh, by that rock that followed them everywhere they went. That's the power of Almighty God. Yes. Yeah, which was a different, it wasn't the same. Yeah, it was a different place. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. They just didn't get. Yeah. Yeah, they were very limited. I'll tell you what, yeah, they're very limited. They still, uh, we're going to find out later, you know, when Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Okay, we're going to see that they still had not yet fully understood everything about Jesus of who he really was. And so he had to explain it to them. He had to explain it to them. Right. Everything was all, uh, everything was physical. The kingdom was physical. The kingdom that he was going to establish, they believe it to be physical and not spiritual. We're going to be talking about that. Maybe not tonight, but next Wednesday night. You know, that uh, everything was still on a physical mindset. They just could not get them, uh, get themselves to go beyond the physical. They just stayed there and they just, and so Jesus continued to work with them. He continued to mold them and shape them into the person they wanted to, he wanted them to become. But it was going to take a while. But finally, they came to the realization. We're going to get to that later. They did come to the realization that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, that he was the son of the living God. But they had to be told. We're going to get to that point, but I'll just say it right now. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter is the one who said it. 
He says, who, who does the crowd say that I am? Well, Jesus knew exactly what the crowds were saying, who he was, if they, but he wanted to test them. That was, that was a lead in question so that he could come up with a follow up question, all right? So the very first thing he says is, who do other people say that I am? And they say, well, Elijah and the prophets and all this, John the Baptist. And all. He says, yeah, but now who do you say that I am? Then Peter just spoke up and said, you are the Christ Messiah. You are God's Christ. Because Christ and Messiah are the same thing. It means the anointed one. Uh, but others who recorded that, Matthew goes on beyond that. He says, no, he is, he is the Christ, the son of the living God. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. But Peter did not, did not come up with that on his own. God the Father told him to say that. Then when God the Father told him to say that, then they finally got it, that he was the Messiah. They weren't, even, they weren't even willing to acknowledge the fact that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ, that he was the Son of the living God. They just could not get them to uh, get themselves from thinking on a physical level. And so finally, God the Father had to tell Peter, would you please say this, <laughs> that he is the Son of the living God, that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior of the world. And so that's the reason why Peter said it, because God the Father told him, among all the other uh, 11 apostles. But he had to be told by God. Jesus says the only reason why you know that, Peter, is because, because God in heaven told you to say it. Because he wouldn't have said that. Peter would have remained silent also had not God told him to say it. And so they were always just on a physical level. They never could get away from that. Um, but this had to be just absolutely fascinating because Jesus was about to form this spectacular miracle and the apostles were unaware as they were unaware of everything that was taking place at this moment. So next, after they had all sat down, let's look at uh, verse 15. Who has it? Loopy, you want to read that? This is Luke chapter 9. Okay. Just uh, go ahead and read verse 15 and 16. Luke chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looked up to heaven. He blessed them and break and gave it to the disciples to set before the multitude. Okay, so he looked up into heaven and what does he do? He blesses the, uh, he blesses the food that is about to be distributed. He blesses the food that's about to be distributed. Uh, it's going to be sanctified. Did you know that's when we, uh, when we say a prayer before, before a meal, that, that food is being sanctified by God. Every, every, everything that God created is good, is good, and uh, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. All food is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. It is sanctified because God said it is clean that you can eat anything you want to. It's also sanctified because you're praying and you're blessing the food. And so this is the reason why we uh, say a prayer before we eat. Uh, that's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, that it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. In other words, God uh, said it, and, uh, and then we bless it. Jesus is doing the same thing right here. He's blessing the five loaves and two fish. So he looks up into heaven and he says, he said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves because that's what they did. I mean, it wasn't tearing, it wasn't cutting, it was breaking the loaf and gave them to his disciples and set before the crowd. So Jesus took the small lunch 
this little boy had that was supposed to last him for the whole day that Andrew was able to finesse through his influence and through his charismatic personality to give up and therefore willing to sacrifice for the greater good, so to speak. <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly, you know, all the things, well, we don't know all the things that Andrew said to this young boy, <laughs> but nevertheless, the food came to Jesus. So Jesus took the five loaves of bread. Isn't that amazing? He takes, he doesn't create the food. The food is created, by the way. We know that. It was created. Thousands and thousands of fish were created. Thousands were created. Thousands of loaves of bread were created. But he did it from five loaves and two fish. He used what the, what the young boy had, and then he used that to create more of it. That's power. I mean, that's the, it was nothing for him to do that. It was absolutely nothing for Jesus to do it. There's, you know, there's, man could not do that, no matter how hard he tried. But it was nothing for Jesus to do it. So he divides all this up among the disciples. I don't know how they received the two fish. You know, he had the five loaves. He divided. They, he divided the five loaves among twelve apostles. You couldn't divide two fish <laughs> among twelve apostles. But he divided the meal. But I'm sure he just created the fish right there in each one of the. You know, as they distributed uh, all that food uh, to all. You know, to twenty five thousand people as they're sitting down in fifties and in hundreds. That had to be just an absolutely spectacular sight. I mean, we cannot even imagine what was happening because you know that they weren't just sitting there. They weren't just sitting there all, you know, with stoicism in their heart, just stoics. They weren't stoics. I mean, there's probably no telling what, can you believe this? I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to because I know that, you know, um, that went, uh, I don't want to scare anybody. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, I mean, can you imagine every single person said, wow. I mean, they were just, they had to be delirious. They had to be so excited that all this was happening, that they were having this, not only were they having a meal, but they were having all they wanted. Every, uh, no one was going to go hungry that day. That's how, many, uh, that's how much food that the Lord created for them. Uh, and so they were multiplied until all were given the amount necessary where every single person, every one of their needs were being met. They all ate, and they were all satisfied, every single one of them. Um, next Wednesday, we're going to look at some scripture concerning uh, the Lord meeting our needs. But I want to mention this. After it was all said and done, and we don't know how long it took them to eat, I mean, for it all to be distributed to 25,000 people, and then they ate until every single one of them were full. And then after they were full, Jesus says, okay, go get the leftovers. And so they went around, you know, because they picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. Everyone had plenty to eat. But Jesus did not want to waste any of the food. What does that tell us, you know, say to us today? He didn't want to waste any of the food whatsoever. Um, I don't know if you like leftovers. But... Um, you know, someone needs to eat those leftovers. And I know if you don't want to eat them, I'm, I'm sure a dog would love to have it. <laughs> but somebody needs to eat that food. <laughs> uh, so the 12 apostles, they, they pick up all the food and they have 12 baskets. Well, guess what the 12 apostles get? Man, they have their lunch for tomorrow. There's 12 baskets. <laughs> They got 12 baskets full. There's 12 apostles. Each one of the apostles had their own basket. What kind of deal is that? <laughs> and so, um, I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, the way it went. Each apostle got to keep whatever they were able to, uh, uh, to get and to put it in the basket. But 
It was all broken pieces, it says, and so they were able. And so even the broken pieces, even the broken pieces, the Lord said, be sure and get all the leftovers, no matter what they are. And yes. And I think the little boy had all he wanted. He got to sit down too with the rest of them, and he got all he wanted, and he was satisfied as well. There's no doubt about that. He's the one who gave up his lunch, but there was probably a whole lot more he ate than what was going to be in that lunch. That's right. So everybody was satisfied. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful story, and we'll continue this story. Uh, who has to close a prayer? Yes. David, would you mind doing it? Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the love that you showed us through your son's death on the cross. We thank you, Father, for these stories that you allow us to read about, to see your power as it goes through. We know, Father, that you watch over us and that you care for us and that you will provide for us. Even though sometimes when we have a little doubt that you'll come through and show your faith that it might enrich ours, that you are truly faithful to us. We ask you to be with us now as we go forth the rest of this week until we meet again on first day. Lord, we pray that we'll be able to show our compassion to others as you showed your compassion to us. Be with us now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.